Hi everyone. I thought I'd take some time to go through what to expect in 351 this coming semester. And I decided to put all of this in a video so that we can hit the ground running next week and not take an entire lecture period to just cover logistics. Perhaps the most important thing to understand about 351 this semester is that it's going to be a traditional face-to-face -face course, or at least as close to that as I can get given the current COVID situation. And that means this course is not going to work as an online course. It's just not set up that way. For example, not all of the material is available online or in the book. There are some things we're going to talk about that's only being covered in lecture. And similarly, the exams are designed to be proctored live in and in person. I'm not designing them so that they can readily be given online through Blackboard or what have you. Last semester, a few students decided to turn 351 into an ad hoc online course. They signed up and then just stopped coming to class. And that really didn't work well for a variety of reasons that I'll touch on throughout the video. But the bottom line is, attendance in lecture is expected unless you're in quarantine or have any of the typical extenuating circumstances like illness, death in the family, and whatnot. The main exception to face-to-face -to -face is going to be labs. Most of the labs will be online and synchronous because social distancing rules prevent us from getting enough students in the lab at one time. However, a few of the labs will be in person, and what I'm going to do is spread those labs out over a couple of weeks where half the class will come in physically to lab one week and the other half will come in physically to lab the other week, and then on the alternating weeks you'll have an online lab to do. Now, like I just said, the online labs are synchronous. So that means when you're not physically in the lab, you need to be online and at your computer working on lab during your scheduled lab time. Labs aren't just like big homework assignments that you can go off and do on your own time or whatnot, right? A lab is a group activity and we need to work on it as a group. Now, why is that? Well, labs are designed to be exploratory activities. So they're challenging, and some of the questions are intentionally vague to promote discussion. So as such, the expectation is that you need some help to work through the lab. You know, in some sense, lab activities are challenge activities, and they kind of push the limits of what you're learning in the class. So it's really inefficient to do that type of work on your own asynchronously. It's just not designed for that. You end up wasting a lot of time waiting for answers. So you're working through the lab and then you're going to get to this part of the lab where I'm expecting you to ask questions and now you're stuck because you're at home in your dorm room at 2 a.m. or whenever you do your homework and there's nobody that can answer the questions right away. So you have to put it away and move on to something else and send an email and wait till you get an email answer back. And it just makes the lab take a lot longer than it needs to. And if you've talked to your classmates, you know that this class already has a lot of work and we just simply can't afford to make things take longer than they need to. The other important reason for doing labs as a group is I often need to give clarifications to the entire class at once. You know, as you're all talking to each other and bouncing ideas around, sometimes a slightly incorrect idea will start to move around the classroom and then I need to stand up front and say, okay, okay, I see where you're going with this, but let me give you a correction. Let me point you all in the right direction at the same time. And that only works if you're all working on it together at the same time. So bottom line is that lab is part of your weekly schedule and you have to show up online just as if it were a real physical lab in the lab. Something else I'm going to do a little bit different this semester is I'm going to have a lot of flipped lectures. And by flipped, I mean I'm going to give you a video and a section of the book to read and expect that you've read it before coming to class. And then during class, I'll first answer any questions over the video and the reading. And then, as a group, we'll go through some exercise to clarify or reinforce the material. And so for most lectures, especially lectures that you know ahead of time are going to be flipped, bring a laptop if you can, because some of these exercises may be directly out of the homework of the project. So if you have your laptop there, you'll have some class time to get ahead on these assignments. Now again, I'm doing this because I'm trying to make the course take less time overall. I'm trying to make better use of your time. Again, feedback from recent semesters is that the course is an awful lot of work. So what can I do to cut down on that? And the idea of flipping the lectures is that both halves of this can be done more effectively, right? When you have a traditional lecture, 
I take 50 minutes to talk about some topic. And what I found is that a 50 minute lecture can often be converted into a 20 to 25 minute video. The reason these videos can be so short is because they're edited. I can go back and I can take out the dead space and I can take out sections where I've misspoken and had to have corrected myself. And I can look at where I might have been wordy and, and I can find a more succinct way of saying things and so on. So I can save you 35 minutes by doing this in video that you watch on your own time instead of having to come in and listen to that full extemporaneous lecture. And then when you come into class, I can save you even more time because now instead of working on homeworks and projects on your own where you get stuck and you have to stop and send emails and all of that, you now have time to work on this stuff in a group where you already have your peers and you've already lined up your schedules and I'm there and you can ask questions right away. So as a result, you spend less time than you otherwise would on the homework and projects, saving time overall. Now to make this work, of course, you got to show up to class. Now, I expect you to be there at every lecture, unless, of course, you're sick or quarantined or something like that. So if you find that lecture time isn't useful, don't just disappear and wander away and stop coming. Give me some feedback. Let me know what a better way to use that time would be. Right? I'm making some guesses as to what's going to work for this group of 50 students, but every group of students is a little bit different, so help direct that in a useful way. Don't just give up on it. Now, to encourage this, there's going to be an engagement part of your course grade. So let me give a little bit of context. A university is designed to be a community of scholars. Pardon me getting on the soapbox, but I think it'll help you understand my point of view here. Right, the idea is that groups of students and faculty come together and help each other and share ideas and have discussions and so on. And that can really only happen in a communal setting like a lecture. It doesn't happen when you just go online, download your assignment, work by yourself in your dorm room, and the only interaction you ever have with the professor is to turn assignments in. You know, we kind of devolved into that a little bit as we pivoted quickly to online because of COVID, and some of the downsides of that isolationist approach to learning have really become apparent. So as a pushback against that, um, there'll be a part of your grade that's encouraging the more social behaviors. So things like asking questions in class. As you've probably heard every professor before me say, you're almost never the only one with a question. So by coming to class, coming into that public space and asking a question, you're not just helping you, you're helping everybody. You're supporting the community. Likewise, when students post questions in a public forum like Piazza or Discord, help each other answer those questions. I will notice that and that will count towards your engagement grade. You know, be prepared for the flip course meetings. Come having watched the videos, come having read the books, come with questions, right? I don't expect everything to be crystal clear from the video, but I expect you to have watched it and it should be clear by the questions you ask and the progress you make on the in-class assignments that you've put some effort in before you get to class. I'll watch for that and, and reward that. Likewise, be engaged in the labs as well. Bounce ideas off of each other, not just your lab mate, but jump into a breakout session or something like that and have discussions and think about it and wrestle with it. That's why you come to a four-year university and not just the University of Phoenix. Finally, work in pairs and teams. All the labs should be done in pairs. All of the projects should be done in pairs. And most of the homeworks should be done in pairs, maybe groups of three if, if you, we talk about that. Learning is most effective when you're not doing it by yourself. And I will reinforce that by helping you out grade-wise if you tend to work in pairs and teams. So speaking of working in pairs, many of the assignments are designed to be done in pairs. The workload is scoped assuming that you're doing most of it in teams of two. And so last semester, I had an unusually large number of comments about how much work the course was. And I also had many fewer students working in pairs than usual. And I don't think that's a coincidence. When a single person is taking on a workload designed for two, it's going to be a big workload. And I know it's not always fun to try to collaborate online and so on, but that is the world we're living in right now. And it will save you time overall to make that effort. If you try to tackle this whole course on your own, it's going to eat up a lot more time than you might expect. 
because it's just not designed to be done on your own. Okay, so I'll get off my soapbox now and let's talk about the textbook. The official text for this class is the second edition of the Harris and Harris text. You can see the cover here. And the bookstore does have this textbook, but for some reason it doesn't show up under my sections. It's only showing up under Professor Bauman's section, which I believe is section two. So if you want to buy it from the bookstore, just go through section two and you'll have a link to it. However, that's not the best way to get the book. I suggest you go and find yourself a used copy of the first edition. The content is nearly identical. I can only think of one thing in the entire book that's different between the two editions. I'm sure there's more than that, but I can only remember one of them. And it's much, much cheaper. Like you should be able to find a used copy of this first edition for under $15. And I will add that this is one of the few computer science textbooks that's actually worth buying. I totally sympathize with students who don't like buying textbooks because most of my CS textbooks when I was a student were garbage. Either the professor didn't use them and only had a textbook because he thought he had to, or the textbook was so poorly written that it didn't help to read it anyway. This book is an exception. It's very much worth the $15, $20 you'll have to spend for it. All right, now let me spend a few minutes giving you kind of a tour of my webpage and showing you where to find the different things you'll need for the course. So the first thing to understand about me is I really don't like Blackboard. I think Blackboard is just full of way too many tools that were all done at like a C level. It tries to be everything to everybody. And if you've studied software engineering, you know that that just doesn't work very well. You gotta pick one or two features to excel at and not try to give everybody every feature they want. So most of the content for this course is on my personal Grand Valley webpage. So you can see the URL here at the top, also on that previous slide. And so of course it has what you'd expect. We've got some the contact information, office hours, that type of stuff, links to the syllabus. So it's there if you need to see what's in the syllabus. Links to the academic honesty policy. I hope I don't need to say anything about that. And just some pointers to where some different parts of information are. For example, I use Piazza as a discussion board. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, there is a link to Blackboard. Grades are one of the few things I do on Blackboard. But the most important things you'll find there are first, the list of assignments and labs. And then second is the timeline. So if you look in the navigation bar on the left, that third link down is the timeline. And think of that as a bit of a calendar. It's going to keep track of what we cover each day during class, what gets assigned during that day, what's due during that day, and perhaps most importantly, the videos you're supposed to have watched and the sections of the book you're supposed to have read. So for example, before our first meeting, you're supposed to have watched the first five videos. Yeah, we don't have class on Monday, but I put that list there anyway, just to emphasize, I really want you to watch those videos before you get to class. Um, you can see what lab we're going to do. And then later on, this is my best guess of which topics we'll cover on which days, the videos that are related to those topics, the book sections related to those topics and so on. Yeah, this calendar will change as we go through the semester. You know, we'll probably run a little bit behind. That's okay. But this should give you a rough idea of what's coming. Notice here that there's a lot of tests listed. One every one to two weeks. So this was something I tried out last fall and was very popular with the students. And that was having many small tests instead of three really big tests. That lets you focus on fewer topics at one time, gives you a little uh, steadier workload throughout the semester. And so I'm gonna do that again this semester. Expect a test most Fridays. Now, a lot, but not all of the content of the course is going to be in these videos. And so, like I said before, the idea is you watch the video before you come to class, and then we'll fill in any gaps in class, but I don't intend on completely covering the videos in class. Right? We're gonna save that class time to work on the assignments and the projects and help you get through those faster. Now, to help you use the videos a little bit better, there's this link here at the very top of the timeline. It's hard to see because it's in purple. And it gives some additional information about the videos. So for example, it will give you a table of contents. So if you want to go back to video one and watch the part about logic gates again, instead of having to search through the video, I've put a link right there to eight minutes, 12 seconds into the video so you can find those topics a little faster for things you want to review. 
Some of the videos refer to software or data files, so I put links to those in the supplemental resources area. So if you want to download JLS or download a circuit file and play with it on your own, you can do that. And I've also put up some related videos, and that is just somebody else's video on the same topic. In case you watch my video and I'm not quite explaining it the way that you naturally think about it, there's a starting point to find some videos that may line up with your own way of thinking a little bit better. If you find a really good video, please bring it to my attention and I will add it to the list here. Okay, so just to quickly review that, the first place you want to look for stuff for this course is on the main course webpage, this link right here, especially the list of assignments and labs. But when it comes to checking what do I have to do today or what do I have to do for the next class, that is in the timeline. That link is here in the nav bar on the left and it will show you which videos and book sections you should have ready before class and the due dates for any upcoming assignments. If you want more details about the videos, that is this link here at the top of the timeline. Next, a very quick word about Blackboard. You already know what I think about it, but I do use it for grades. I like that you can log in and securely see what grades you have so you know where you stand in the class. Or if I make a mistake, you can see I've made a mistake so I can correct it. The main exception to Blackboard's crappy work is Collaborate Ultra. I think they did a really good job with that online lecture platform. So that's what we'll be using for the online labs. I'll have sessions set up in Collaborate Ultra for each weekly lab that's online. I may also occasionally use Blackboard Collaborate for office hours. Another big tool I will use is Piazza. So Piazza is a standalone discussion board, but one that's very well done. So I will use Piazza for announcements and question and answer. I find it much easier to get well-written announcements posted on Piazza than I do through the clunky web interface on Blackboard. So that's why the announcements are there. I find it easier to search through them and so on. And it's also a good discussion board. So when you have a, the type of question you would ask out loud in class, please put that on Piazza, right? If you want a clarification about something that was done in lecture or a homework or an assignment, that belongs on Piazza. And the reason is, that allows me to answer that question for the whole class at once rather than sending 20 different emails. Because remember, you're usually not the only student with a question. So if you're emailing me a question, I'm probably also getting that same question from five, six, 10 other students. And I like to be able to answer it all at once. Better yet, as a discussion board, you can answer each other's questions, which means when you have a question late at night and I'm not responding to email because I'm already in bed, you still have 49 other students who can see that question and hopefully help you out with that in a more timely manner. Obviously, if you have a question of a personal nature, that should be emailed directly to me. Don't put questions about your grades or whatnot on Piazza. And if you haven't seen it before, Piazza looks like this, where the questions and the announcements start stacking up over here. You can search for them by tags and all of that. Okay, a few words about my teaching style. First of all, I like mouthy students. And by that, I mean I like to know what's going well and what isn't. There are 52 students in the class this semester. You all have different preferences. You all have different styles. And I'm certainly not going to hit the bullseye for every last one of you. But it's very helpful to know when I'm doing something that doesn't quite line up with the way you like things done, I like to know what that is. Sometimes I can adjust especially if it's a common concern. So the more students that raise that concern, then I can recognize that that's a concern for the class as a whole. Sometimes I can't do a whole lot about it, but I at least like to know where I stand. You know, sometimes we'll agree to disagree and I can respect that, but I would rather intentionally respect that difference of opinion than have you just off on your own complaining about it and not at least giving me the chance to, to if not fix it, at least take the edge off of it. So, don't hesitate to let me know if some part of class just isn't working for you. I also like to mess around in class, right? This class is a lot of work. You'll hear that from me. You'll hear that from other students. It's a lot of work. And to survive doing a lot of work, you have to have some fun along the way. So I try to have fun in class as much as is reasonable. The other aspect of that is I want you to be comfortable speaking up in class, right? I want you to be comfortable telling me hey, this, you goofed up on this assignment, or hey, I really don't like the way this is going. And one of the ways to promote that comfort is to, to make sure that I'm not overly serious in front of the class. 
So if I'm goofing around, I just want you to be comfortable. The other reason I want you to be comfortable is I want you to be comfortable answering questions in class, even if you're not 100% sure you're right. This goes back to the community of scholars thing. Right? I'm not just trying to stuff information in your head. I want you to be able to think about and reason about and argue about ideas. And an important way to do that effectively is to have right ideas to talk about and wrong ideas to talk about. A lot of us learn by looking at wrong answers and understanding why they're wrong. Well, where do wrong answers come from? Well, they come from honest mistakes. It's hard for me to intentionally devise a wrong answer to talk about in class. It works much better when somebody raises his hand, offers an answer that's 98% correct, and now we have something interesting to talk about to fix that last 2%. But really, the only way to get students to be comfortable enough to offer up answers that might be wrong is to provide that sort of comfortable, relaxed, sometimes goofy environment. So if it seems like I'm not taking the course seriously, that's not at all the case. I'm just trying to have some fun along the way and providing an environment that's a little more conducive to, to learning, to exploring ideas. Office hours. Right? Office hours are the times I make a point of being in my office and available. However, I make a point of being available Monday through Friday, nine to four, whenever possible, like when I'm not in class or a meeting or something like that. So. Don't wait for these magical office hours to come by my office and ask a question. The only reason I have office hours officially is because the dean says I have to, right? I would really rather you just come by when you have a question. Now, to be fair, official office hours are necessary because some students can't afford to just keep walking by the office hoping I'm there. So it's helpful to have a few hours in the day to know for sure that the professor is going to be there, and that's what office hours are. But that doesn't at all mean you're unwelcome when it's not office hours. If my door is open, it's office hours, come in and ask a question. And I try to make that even a little more clear by leaving my door open in proportion to how available I am. Right? If the door is wide open, it means I've got plenty of time. Come in, ask your questions, talk about the soccer game last night, you know, whatever's on your mind, have a seat, and it's all good. If the door is just open a crack, it means I'm there to help you to answer your questions. But if you just want to have a chat, uh, maybe we'll save that for another time. Important questions are always welcome, and less important questions are more welcome the wider the door is open. Now, like I said earlier, we may have to do some office hours online. I haven't decided whether that'll be Blackboard Collaborate or Zoom. But if that situation comes to pass, I'll just put an announcement into Piazza. All right, so I hope that gives you a good idea of what to expect this semester. Helps you kind of get inside my head a bit and see how I'm thinking about the class and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I really hope you take me seriously when I say, let me know what I can do to help. Uh, let me know what you'd like to see done differently. And I will see you all next week.